I never get nervous until I'm sitting in front of two people looking at me. Really? Firstly, start with an acknowledgement of country. So this talk is happening today on the lands of the Wabakal and Waramai peoples who have been the traditional custodians of this land for millennia. Um, and I pay my respects to any elders, um, past, present or emerging, um, and extend my welcome to any um, members of traditional mob here today. Um, so we're <laughs> filming in Newcastle, New South Wales for anyone um, live streaming. It's quite a warm day today, but we're um, but <clears throat> the beach is beautiful. Um, there's no surf, but um, the, I can confirm that the ocean is a glittering jewel. Um, so <laughs> just a bit of context. But um, so I'm Wednesday Sutherland. Um, I am program curator at the Lockup Newcastle. Um, I'm also a visual artist. Um, I mostly work with photographic media. Um, and I guess I would say that I'm an early career curator <laughs> as well. Um, and today I'm lucky enough to be hosting um, Heath Knock in conversation at Wester Gallery. Um, thanks, Justin, for hosting this talk today. Um, and probably <coughs> follow a fairly loose <coughs> format and um, just ask Heath a few questions about his practice and about the show that we've got um, behind, behind us at the moment. Um, yeah, hey, so would you like to um, maybe introduce to the audience a bit of background on you, who you are, how you started painting, how you learned? <laughs> I started painting, I guess I started drawing first. How far back do you want to go? As far back as you like. Well, as a kid, we were travellers, so we... I still lived in an apartment and all that, but we were from the showgrounds, still constantly moving. And when I say the showgrounds, like the Royal Easter Show, Newcastle Show, any of those shows, and I would always be in trucks, so I was given colouring in books. So that was, yeah, that I, that's the beginning of it. From there, throughout the whole of school, I was always painting. I don't think that I was looking at paintings as very emotional, they were very very structural to me. Mm. I was really into the tech drawing, mm. like, you know, schematics and plans. Mm. From there I'd be painting, painting through the whole high school. Wasn't really, I don't know if I like, I think I mucked up a fair bit in art classes. <coughs> I was pushed away from art classes more into design and technology. <coughs> School was coming to a close when I finished you know, with year 12 and I had to figure out what I wanted to do and I wanted to go to art school but it just, I was the first person in the family to finish year 12 so mm. university just seemed like a different planet. So I focused in on tattooing mm. and I pretty much tattooed for 20 years, yep. always painting but you know, I was a bit of an outcast in that world as well, just, just still, you know playing by the rules of tattooing, but the art was definitely always there and was pushing through. Yeah. About like, a good few years ago, I decided that I'd kind of achieved what I wanted to in tattooing and it was time to really push the oil paintings. Mm -hmm. Things that I just were, you know, doing on occasions and was always seeing art and learning as much as I could. A lot of the Australian impressionist artist always moved me there was paintings that I just can't I just will remember to this day in detail so. is there one but, in particular that stands out yeah there's a painting that Charles Conder did of it's called the Chinese gardens and it's a small painting on a cigar box mm -hmm. and it's of Chinese gardens which are pretty prominent in most cities Sydney was, was full of them, but the land that it was on became Randwick Boys, which was a school that I went to. Right. So it really kind of moved me that to think of that land was had a different life before. Mm. You know, that, that school was the best place for me. I loved it. It was so structural. Mm. I kind of needed that in life. And yeah, that painting really moved me. And, and all of this, you know, Condor and Streeton, mm. they just... 
those paintings were just they had something that I had never seen yeah. I felt like I kind of was always pushing them in the background like I needed to answer those paintings yeah. like seeing them I needed to kind of do something I couldn't just look at them yeah. something had to happen so. like answer a question that exactly. made it to you yeah yeah. yeah. I, you know they were kind of looking at a painting of Redfern Station and thinking what's the answer to that it's more of that what can I I need to do something what can I contribute to the mm -hmm. art world do you think that comes from like an emotional sort of definitely. inquiry yeah, yeah. it That's definitely like broke it. so as much as illustration has been more of a detail and skill set and it's very like you can't be ultimately loose on an illustration mm. for me mm. it had to be perfect it had to be scale composition had to be right painting started becoming more of an emotion I love abstract painting mm. but I don't think it's something that I would generally practice mm. so interesting yeah well a lot of like a lot of artists have a very um have, will have a background in technical drawing mm -hmm. or um um my father is a painter and he had a background in animation so like having that foundational draftsmanship is a really solid place for painting to come from and mm -hmm. for i think it sort of um, illustrates just how um, sorry I'm just looking at the works um, like how skilled you are technically in actually abstracting um, and giving life to things like um, if the audience looks over to the work behind them um, Noel um, the abstraction of the basketball um, Talia. Ba backboard That's Talia. oh Talia, yeah. Talia. <laughs> sorry um, Talia yeah um, like that you can't achieve that without a strong level of technical refinement in, in drawing um, but that also leads me to another question so um, could you explain why that work is called Talia but would you also like to give the audience the background into that work that you gave to me well about the that abstraction that yeah mentioned? for sure yeah, yeah. exactly yeah, yeah. I was in America tattooing. This this show had been planned for quite some time. It got moved around a couple of times on my behalf, but I was in America and I was thinking about what was next, what was I, I was going to depict. I really wanted landscapes to come in. And anyway, that image had come to my head, but at the time, as soon as I'd landed in America, I'd had a macular detachment, which meant I had liquid feeding into my eyes. Mm. and it was creating this bubble so everything I saw had a wobble in it mm. and it was driving me insane I can imagine <laughs> I had to tattoo with these like with these magnifying glasses that were like I think it was the highest I could get from a, from mm. a chemist and it, it just the whole thing it was just completely driving me insane mm. and I had to depict it because I couldn't describe it to anyone no and I decided well what do I want in this show? And I, it, it was just, it all started, all the images started flooding into my head. And I was trying to tell Talia, like, I'm kind of struggling over here. This is really hard to see. I'm driving. I can't read a menu. I could tattoo well enough. Everything was fine there. I mean, it tattooing, that's unbelievable, by the way. Tattooing is <laughs> a skill, you know? Like, it, it's like chiseling a, a, a dove joint. Well, it's you muscle can, memory, though. Yeah, you can, you, if you, even if you, you dealing with something you can work through it but that's what I saw every time I looked at a road sign that's how I saw it and it drove me nuts so in calling it Talia is this a like hey Talia I'm not lying about this either it's yeah really significant yeah <laughs> look I think a lot of the titles don't make sense but they do to me they they remind me of a person you paint I guess we're all meant to paint with a with a story at the beginning. But I feel like Frankenstein was a slab of meat until something was the electricity was pumped into him and the life was there. So sometimes I feel like you have that's what gives it its life. Mm. And but also conversely the audience's yeah. perception of it as well. Yeah. It has like a whole other life to it yeah I, I just think I just every time I was like 
Carly, look, this is what my eyes were like. I, from this distance, when you look at that backboard, there is two mixtures. There's actually four mixtures of white paint in there, mm. and they're they're all layered. Mm. So there's that like that edge that vibrates as the white transitions to the blue. Mm. We might be able to see it better than most other people. That was another important thing that was happening with my vision as well. Mm. That was the hardest. I really thought I ruined that painting. I had to leave it alone for about four days because mm. I just hated. I hated the way it was looking, but it was because I was still having that eye condition. Uh, now the eye condition's gone, so anyone watching this, <laughs> you can book me to get tattooed, it's totally fine. But it was, you got to imagine, I was still seeing that curve as I was painting that, and I was trying to paint it, and then I was still seeing a curve within a curve. Mm. It was it was just mind-bending. Well, that makes it even more impressive, um, really. It's, yeah, I, I think all of that packaging for that frame, it, mm. it's, it's all there. Is a story. Totally. Um, yeah, I think another thing that would be good for the audience to know is how... Uh, maybe I should start with actually how the show was conceived Yeah. first, and then I'll go into my next question. Yeah, so... <clears throat> I was driving in America alone, and I started to notice what makes Australia so different in landscape. I think that was the breaking point. Mm. That's why I wanted to bring the landscapes in. But the composition of these pieces, <clears throat> the way that I was... I feel, I feel like landscape and still life, they're great, but to me there's just not enough in the storytelling of it. There's something missing. I needed something there. So I was envisioning these landscapes with these still lifes or moments next to each other. Mm. And it reminded me of when I was a kid, I used to have this reoccurring nightmare slash dream. <coughs> it happened all the time. Mm. And it was of my face hard against a television screen to the point where my nose is touching and two split images were coming. Mm. And I would see, it was always happening when coming off the showgrounds, we, we still had involvement at Darling Harbour, so I'd be sleeping in like a caravan next to a, uh, an octopus, which was a hydraulic ride, and everyone's screaming, right? And I'd always have this image of, like, the left side was of numbers and of very abstract forms, mm -hmm. and the right was rides. They are always, like, dodging cars or merry-go-rounds or whatever, mm -hmm. and it just kept happening with the numbers coming into it, and... I don't know why, but I can remember that dream. Whenever I think, that's how I think. When I think of an image, there's always the next image coming, and it's they just it's like that internal. Mm. It's always so this is just what my mind looks like. Mm. It's kind of a bit chaotic. There's always something extra happening. I think it's quite measured as well. Yeah. <laughs> um, that actually answered my next question. Sorry. Um, no, that's fine. That's totally fine. Um, it's funny that you, I think when we spoke about this earlier, you didn't, you mentioned the dream, but I, maybe I didn't remember that it was um, of a television screen. Yeah. Um, because we've spoken about how these, like to me, I find the works kind of semi photographic in composition. Mm -hmm. um, there's definitely a photographic influence. I think this work behind me sort of illustrates that the best. Well, that. That was, that tree was a film photo I took. Mm, yeah. That's so, right. yeah, yes. But there is also, because you've got, you know, within the frames, you've got these sort of transitions and bleeds, like, to, they do look like, nearly like film strips. Well, originally the whole thing was meant to have that film bleed. Mm, yeah, yeah. And but like I guess you, you set it out, and I guess you set out to do the painting, and you... you you have this idea of I want the images to move with one another in this manner and you do it a couple of times and then you start to think well maybe it would be better if it moved this way and mm. so yeah you're right there's on some of them it's very that pink that bleeds like mm. I love it I love film when it when it is poorly developed <laughs> I, like I love <laughs> photography like that is, 
Yeah. I think I like rate my photography and film, and it is so subpar, so amateur. Yeah. And I kind of love that. I love the graininess. I love how out of focus it is. I, I love the experiments. Yeah, the when it's things. I love buying old film that's going to develop wrong, and then people developing like, well, these are <coughs> shit. They're my favourites. So. Yeah. I I like soft edges. I really. They're not really meant to have that hard edge. They've got a mm. that tension that's built up from just where you're trying to find where one colour meets the next. Mm. That's it's really important in the work. Mm. The, um, that hatred of hard edges sort of leads into um, why you choose to sort of use this strip of solid colour. Yeah, I think the bottom of your painting. You can <laughs> you can probably blame that on Jubilee. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that which she kind of did it as that this is the end of a still life. So it's mm. like the bench. And normally the bench would be out of focus and mm. hard black, or it would be, and she would paint red. Mm. And just when I figured out why she did it, it's like I can't get rid of it. Why do you think she did it? Well, I think she just did it to bring a bit of interest into the edge of the still life. Mm. I. I it was pointed out to me by another artist, by Les Rice, who was like, oh, yeah. there's, you know, the edge of the table is important as, yeah. like, what sits on top of it. Well, it's part of the conversation. Yeah. yeah. I think just the way that Jude brought that colour in, it just, it nails her paintings. Mm -hmm. It Sometimes they look like they're in an aquarium and then all of a sudden there's this, like, hard red line. Yeah. So. You also told me that you just hated the bottom of I hate it. Yeah, I also hate the sides. Like on, like on the sides of them. Sometimes it just feels like the painting just drifts away, you know. Mm. So it definitely is that for mm. sure. I, you know, figuring out how, you know, seeing Jude do it and it made sense. Bringing into my work is because I, I hate it like that. In the photograph, like in the photograph, that had a creep below it. So let's just say if I was like, all right, I really, the tree is the important part and the tension in the background mm -hmm. and just the way that that grass sits, it's, yeah. If I, painted, later if, you can. if I painted that creek, it would just, it, it would just lose it. Mm -hmm. The whole bottom would be this, oh yeah, cool, it's literal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So I just nail this giant peach pink end on it and it does everything that I want. It's just there. I've just painted out the, the stuff that I hate in the, yeah. the pictures. Well, I guess which is what you do. I mean, I'm not trying to. I'm not trying to copy a photo. I'm trying to. We well, are painting from memory a lot of the time. Yeah, pretty much all of the time. Well, I'll block it in, and then I'll never look at the photo again. Mm. It's just I'm trying to like, suck out the essence of it, and mm. figure it there, and then then it's up to me to manipulate it. Yeah, yeah. I think it's pretty pretty successful. You know, like the branches and that, they're all gestural strokes. There's no yeah. colour on them. They're just, you, whatever angle you stand on, yeah. the light actually implies the branch rather than any paint really does. Yeah, well, that's the same. I mean, photographers work with light as a medium. Yeah. Like, I think people forget that, you know, light. Like, painters are obviously working with light as mm. well, you know, and in the order of the application of the paint as well, working. Do you work dark to light? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, totally. I, Which is sort of the old I way try not to muddle any of the colours with white. Mm -hmm. I think that's the better way to answer it is yeah. I, tr I try to make the those heavy whites come in near the end. Yeah. If need be. Yeah. Because, you know, a lot of the darker tones, they're semi-transparent. They'll dry quicker. They'll soak into the linen quicker. Mm -hmm. They just... You just build it up to mm -hmm. that. It also brings life into it. Mm -hmm. Whereas white seems to just... Yeah. Kind of dull it. Not that I, I would not call myself a painter. At times when I have attempted to paint, and it was normally my dad instructing me, he would, um, he would say, always dark to light. You mm. always work dark to light. And, yeah. You know, that's the way that the Renaissance masters painted. And it's a very long tradition in oil painting, yeah. which has a practical purpose in the, you know, the opacity of paint. Yeah. Um, but also it sort of allows you to focus first on shadows um, and then into your mid-tones and then into your highlights. Yeah, it's sure. is quite a, sort of a photographic, well, it's sort of, I guess pre-photographic way of yeah. approaching painting. You know, you can, you can, near the end of some of these paintings, like that Noel painting, all the darkness... That's the Noel painting. Not the all the darkness <laughs> is glazed into it at the end. So mm. there's, a, there's a brown called Mummy Brown, mm. and a 
it's quite a red rich depth you can only really use it successfully near the end you can build it up at the start but it doesn't really do much mm. and at the end there's mummy brown and a olive green in there and the way mm. that the two work it, I guess that's what would the fire would really be doing it would be like dulling the colours but there would still be lights there still has to be a definition somewhere mm. there it's not like complete darkness yet yeah of course yeah um would you say you're a self-taught painter then? I am. I well, with advice from people. With I didn't kind of fumble my way through it. I was reading a lot of books like Max Meldrum, mm-hmm. so tonalism. Mm-hmm. So I, you know, very into Australian tonalism. Because mm-hmm. you're very widely read. Like that's yeah, I've well, noticed through our conversations is your knowledge of Australian, the Australian canon far exceeds mine. I guess, I guess I was reading a lot to try and figure it out before I was actually practicing it. Mm. There was a point where I just, well, you kind of have to start Mucky. diving in. Yeah. But it was a lot of the Dutch golden, you know, Dutch 17th century still life mm. that, that mesmerised me. There was like shows that came through Australia. Mm. There was one at the uh, Art Gallery in New South Wales. Mm. That really set me on the path. I saw that. Yeah, it was, I, I forget the name of the, yeah. the museum, but yeah. there were some of my favourite paintings that were there. So I was trying to figure out that by reading the literature mm. that was around it. And I guess, you know, I had art tutorials taught to me, but nothing that really guided me. Mm. Luckily enough, I've had a lot of very good friends that are really good artists. Don't know if there's so much guide my hand or any advice in the paint but they're little bits of philosophy that's that's the major part that helps in a lot of these I read every day for for anything about art that is very clear (laughs) yeah I don't really read much I know a lot of artists read literature literature to get the story but I kind of read other artists talking about art Mm. and just every day something comes up Mm. And it might be something that I'm doing and it'll let me understand it a bit more. Mm. Um, who, who are some of these artists that you would have sort of guided you? Oh, if God. You can say? It's funny enough, hey. I'd... Is Les someone who's guided? Oh, definitely. Yeah. Well, like, yeah. Les's wisdom in, in, in painting for sure, mm. without a doubt. Um, mm. That whole the tension between the movement of colours, something that's from the Rococo. Mm, yeah. You know, where one ends. It's atmosphere, I guess, really, yeah, what yeah. it is. So, just speaking with Les about Rococo paintings, which is kind of funny. Everyone's seen a Rococo painting and you're like, oh, it's kind of cool, it's kind of grand. Mm. But until you really start to understand those paintings, mm. they really, like, when you really start to understand them, they slap you in the face. They're mm. incredible. Yeah. They're like, there, there will be an image of a of a person in the corner that is so unresolved mm. but in the whole space it's so well resolved like it crisps and up it, it gets crisp at a certain distance away mm. you're meant to like stand back they look quite large all. yeah and I think yeah. I think discussions with Les really helped with that yeah if There's, anyone doesn't know um, Leslie Rice's work he's also a tattooer and yeah. a painter and he's uh, I, has he won the Archibald? he's, a he's multi- won the Moran multi- twice the Moran, he has one. Yeah, he's been ones. in he's been in the Archibald a bunch of times. Yeah, a few times. And the the, the other awards attached to it. Yeah. There's um Dossi. Benedict Dossi who shows a chalk horse. I speak with him a bit. Oh, okay, yeah. Which is, I think nearly everyone that I, nearly everyone a chalk horse I'll speak to. Yeah. That that gallery is full of a lot of people that are like talking about contemporary art. Mm. That's and I'm not saying that no other gallery is doing it. You know, your vuz, people that work, like, yeah. that are showing there. <clears throat> I'm always around these groups, you know, yeah, so. Yeah. Well, I think that's, like, I think that's important to acknowledge because, you know, like, in this, like, social media age, you know, we're kind of living in screens and communicating, like, via text all the time. And, like, like for millennia, like, this is how artists have learned yeah. and grown and developed their skills, you know, through conversations, through talking yeah. in the studio, through meeting at openings, or I think if you've whatever. got a good studio practice, I think conversations more beneficial than totally. than like practical 
help and advice. I, mm. yeah, I, always, I also like have no problem with failure. I don't show every painting. There's a whole bunch that have failed. Yeah. I've got pushed the mediums to the point of seeing at where they fail. Yeah. You know, I've followed... Like, a, the, a lot of the Australian Impressionist painters were painting on cigar boxes, mm. which are pretty much balsa wood. They're quite absorbent. And balsa floats. Yeah, and yeah. And what they would use is just the oil. They mm. would they wouldn't break it down with any kind of terps or anything. It was just oil. Mm. So yeah. so alright, so I'll do that. And all those paintings were ruined. Because they all crack because the oil didn't yeah. dry, the pigment cracks, so Yeah. I can't remember the term. Yeah. I guess I guess good studio practice is like it's like art school, you know. You're constantly mm. moving and doing and things up and trying something new mm. every painting I've done here I've like I've, I've had a bit of a knot in my throat I'm like oh shit how am I going to do it so it's not not really done with these I know it's going to be a good image if I start off with that if I kind of have to problem solve mm. have to figure out oh, how the hell am I going to do that I know that it's worth doing yeah if I've if I'm kind of looking at it and I go oh this is easy I'll put this here and this there I'm like alright it actually I've got to stop either re-scrap it's re sketch the design or just think a little longer it's, mm. it's got to be hard yeah yeah. so I'm to always to learning to learn them, yeah. but I'm kind of always asking hearing and teaching myself at the same time yeah. a good art store is another place to have one yeah. you, you go to a great art store and people are just the knowledge is They're in there yeah, as well definitely. I feel like at the beginning you're really you're wrestling with the medium more than that yeah because you don't know yeah. Like, how's this going to react with yeah. this? And they're like, oh, I don't try that. Because... You figure out a lot of those paintings are pretty mm. pretty weak. and Yeah, cool. You kind of like, I've finished it. <laughs> it looks like something. Yeah, sure. And then you've got to break that down and make it feel and feel yeah. like something as well as look like something. So. Yeah. Oh, cool. Thanks. Um, I, maybe you could speak to the um, orange dots in some of these works. So we've got some in the work behind us. Yeah. Um, and also in my favourite, Trolls. Trolls? Yeah. Is that? Yeah. yeah. Um, so that's a that's a name as well. Um, it is. I don't know. I tried to Google He's it. He's a friend of mine. Ah, uh, okay. Yes. Yeah. He's a Scandinavian friend with a very bizarre name. It sounds very Scandinavian. Yeah. <laughs> Trollsy. Trolls. But they, yeah, the way this, it, it's, it's, what a weird name, but anyway. Mm. It reminds me of Trolls. Mm. Um, the orange dots, I'm still figuring out why they're there. Is that just an innate sort of... I think it's a... I think it follows the line of the numbers that are, that I'd have in a dream as a on kid. On the left. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, because they really do start to sit on the left. Hey? It's you quite synesthetic. Like... Yeah, I'm looking at them now. It's quite synesthetic the way that you describe. I don't that. understand why there's the number of them. Mm. I think the... That's quite subconscious, and it comes while looking at the painting before it's finished. Mm. So generally, what I'll do is I'll I'll have a mock up of how I'm going to paint. Won't be strict, but there will be a mock up. And as I'm building through it, I'll start to wipe paint away or draw with chalk circles. Mm. And they've just started to appear. The orange is part of my palette. I have a strict palette. Yeah. I think you can see that there's other colours yeah. that come in, but my palette mainly is raw umber, mm. indigo, orange, and white. Mm. Yeah. I didn't realise that until a frame of friend of mine who's framed a lot of works, who's worked over in the tape, and he pointed it out. He just he broke down the palette, and mm. I didn't realise it was that prominent. I just thought it was, well, these are four giant cans of paint that I have it. In the studio, I just use them. Yeah, yeah. And I love orange. Yeah. And he's like, I think it's because you are so influenced by Francis Bacon. And <laughs> yeah, it's, actually, it's weird because yeah, I am. Those are his yeah. colors, the purple and the orange. I, Francis Bacon reminds me of my mum. Mm. My mum used, my <laughs> mum was. A, I know, my mum was a really. She was just an alcoholic. Yeah, and I was going to say he's a Yeah, she just. She just constantly rambled this junk speech. But there was a lot of heart in there. She understood something, but it was just... 
And the work of Francis Bacon is not what reminds me of my mum. No. Watching videos of him, of him waffle in French and just just things saying things like, yeah. you know, when I die, put me in a pa- in a bag and chuck me outside. Yeah. And these yeah. are things my mum and her family would say. Yeah. So I don't I look I, my mum passed away, so I deeply miss her. Okay. So I think the orange just I think they're just there for that. Mm, that's interesting. Yeah. yeah. They'll change colour. I know that in especially in my tattoo. Green dots earlier as well. Green like, dots. You, or you were thinking about some green dots in a different work. Oh yeah, in that work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. I don't know why that would be green. Mm. But I, Turner speaks about shapes in paintings that will bring emotion. Mm. Mm. And that That's painting that has the you know the power lines. Which is very sort of um, street as well. It's kind of got that motion of of electricity moving and I mm. felt how would I really nail that to someone which was put two green dots to make it look like almost a smiley face that has a very bleak mouth at the bottom of it mm. yeah. so I was wrestling that with that for a while but it just didn't make it mm. I, d- I don't know why okay. so I, I mean I'm, I'll do things in paintings that maybe I'm influenced by another artist or maybe I'm just influenced by something of myself but they're, they're yeah. there mm. And I'll figure them out. You know, mm. We spoke about the Jasper Johns. Yeah. yeah, you know Jasper Johns. The flag series of Jasper Johns. Those those flag paintings came from a dream of his, and mm. I was reading. It's quite surrealist. Yeah, okay, those paintings are incredible. Yeah, they they're are. so heavily built up, and mm. they're just constantly added upon. Mm. I guess the practice in that is the application. And every application, there's something, some new layer of it going in. But I, anyway, I'd read too much Jasper Johns and had a dream that that painting was going to be like a flag, and that's how that came. It's so flag-like, and I'm it so is. glad that you included it though, because you were unsure. Yeah, well, it was it from a discussion fun. with you. Was... Yeah. Um, side note: If anyone is interested in the work of Jasper Johns, there's a great show at Lake Mac at the moment. Is it? Bergen Johns, yes, yeah, oh. touring from the National Gallery of Australia. Australia. Get down and see it. Focuses on their printmaking. Yeah, it's amazing. He's um, like Jasper Johns is definitely an American. Con- that what he would be modern, right? Well, they're, well, they're, they're anti anti American impressionists or expressionists. Yeah. Well, so what he was like in that the transition between abstract expressionism. Mm-hmm. And you know, quite representational work coming back into the fold. Yeah. You know, like he was just before Gustin mm. brought out those paintings that just shocked the world. Mm. I, I love his work. I think you should all look at Jasper Johns. It's, it's incredible. Definitely great about the exhibition. Yeah. Um, I'm just conscious of time, so I might just um, get you to speak to um, your partner Talia Underlet. 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 Underlay, sorry, um, the ceramic works of the mm. show. So yeah. the title of the show, if I haven't said it already, is Smile. Um, so we've got one work that you can see behind me, um, but I was also really interested in your story about how the three clowns oh, in yeah, the doorway, cool. yeah. um, how, that, how those came about. So... Was Talia always going to be included in the show? Or was no, it like, yeah. I'd really... Rec- well, I don't know. I guess we'd have to ask Justin. Anyway, I'd, I'd asked, I'd asked Kutalia, because the works, you'll start to see in time, a lot of the work that I do will be of Talia's ceramics. Mm. And I think they're the first ones that Talia's reversed that on me. Mm. So that, the original clown is a gift, well, they're prizes from the showgrounds. Mm. So back in the 60s, instead of getting plush toys, you'd get chalk objects. Chalk. Yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah, they're just, I don't know what, they were just they were made out of chalk. They're like ceramics, mm. chalk of some sort. And my grandfather would make them, but he would also make things like rocking horses out of uh, fiberglass. Mm. You had like a different, the prizes were different. Mm. You had cardboard faces that the kids would be running around. Very, very crude. Anyway, <laughs> my grandmother had passed away and we were clearing out six acres of... 60 years of shit. My grandmother is a proud Romani gypsy, right? Like, when I say she's French gypsy, um, and she just could never get rid of anything. 
we had junk everywhere. Mm. I mean, we're giving junk to people. You give us money, you go on the ride, or you give us money, you get the junk. Yeah. And she just, I love she obsessed with certain things. Anyway, luckily enough, she saved those clowns, and we were going through all the junk. And this is the first time I ever took a gift, ever. And I'd said, I'm taking this clown. Like, you know, Dad had said, it's, oh, they're the gold prizes. He dismisses everything because that the showground for him is like his own journey. Mm. I'd taken it, I'd painted it. Mm. Did the painting. Anyway, Talia ended up taking it and casting it as a, for a slip, you know, to make ceramics. And in doing so, destroyed it. The chalk, because the chalk filled up with water. That's it. Yeah. So we ended up saying, "Well, look, now that's it. You're the only one with them." So she makes those clowns. They're really eerie and ghostly. Mm. It's, I mean, for me to look at them, they they completely blow me away. Mm. They blow my dad like away. Clowns. <laughs> yeah. Well, don't grow up on the fucking showgrounds if you're afraid of clowns. Totally. I had an uncle named Ray that was a clown. <laughs> the knock name uncle still Ray. has a circus. One of the most famous clowns is Billow Knock, with okay. my last name. So, unfortunately, I cannot be afraid of clowns. They're yeah. just there. No, you cannot. So, yeah, I, I, the other jobs as well. I never, you know, when you live with an artist, you don't really understand their work. You just like, yeah, that's Ooh. cool. <laughs> this is I love it. Uh, you know, once this show and these pieces were put in here, the work mm. really special it makes mm. sense to me there's a certain there's a folkiness there's a clownness to it there's she, she's like inherited a lot of stories from the showgrounds from my dad on the show you know show families like the females inherit all the knowledge right yeah, it's well I mean cool. like Gypsy, Romani Roma life is you inherit stories we don't have anything written down yeah there's not many books there's a lot of photos but there's a lot of stories that mm. come. Somehow all of it's like crescendo in all these pieces. Mm, they're incredible. Yeah. I mean, she's going to have to speak on her own. Yeah. I'm was... more like... I I think that you'll see a lot of those of her works in my works and vice versa. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I. We have a lot of people come to our house and they'll go through the studio and they'll see you know, an object that's in a painting and they'll be like, oh, that's it there. It's funny because you can see in their face that the... It's so lackluster. They're like, oh, there's that thing that you paint. It looked great as a painting. But I feel like the goal is to suck the life out of it, like the soul <laughs> out of that object and put it into the painting. Yeah, yeah. It's kind of... It's interesting. It is. It is. I see those, the, those works and I'm like, in an angle and with a shadow cast. Mm, yeah, the shadows. They just, yeah, they, they need to be in here. Yeah. They work in the works. They do. Yeah. Um... I could keep talking forever. Yeah, apologies, same. Um, I think we might, I think that's a nice way to sort of um, end. Yeah. Just with the involvement of Talia, who is, um, if I didn't say clearly, Talia is um, Heath's partner as well. Um, so, um, yeah, on, on that note, does anyone have any questions that they would like to ask Heath about his process or the series? Could rattle on and no one's. Yeah, I think we really <laughs> both talk forever if given the option um yeah well if no one has any questions yeah. then i might wrap it up there yeah. awesome thanks thanks, thanks, Heath. Um, thanks right. justin for hosting this talk this has been great and i've loved every second of your about your yeah, my and i hope you, <laughs> and i hope um i hope you guys learned something today as well thank you right. i'm sure there'll be more in time to answer about certain parts of why they're there yeah thank you so much for coming and listening. Yeah, thanks. Thanks. Thanks.